the misty mountains cold to dungeons deep and caverns old. Tell me about the selection of what you are presenting and why you chose these scenes in particular. Uh, well, it was written by a couple of things. Um, because Andy Circus, Martin Freeman, Richard Armitage, and Ian McKellen are all going to be, you know, here to do interviews, I sort of I, I chose scenes that feature those particular four actors. Um, obviously, you know, we're in July now, and the film's not coming out till December. So, you know, the the amount of choice that I've got is limited a little bit um, by the the work that the visual effects team are doing. So. You know, it, it, the stuff that I, I um, chose to screen is a little bit more character-based, I guess. It gives people a feeling of the story, of the, um, the tone of the film. And will, will you be showing in 24 or 48 frames per second? 20, old-fashioned 24 frames a second. Now, is that a, is that a uh, consequence of the facilities here, or is it in reaction to what happened at CinemaCon? Well, it's both. I mean, you, you can't really separate the two. You see, my, I mean, the, the thing that I found with 48 frames a second is that, is that it's something that you have to get used to. You literally have to sit there and watch a movie and you have to just and and you know after after a short period of time you completely forget about it um, but, but but by the time the film's finished you you know it's been a nice smooth um, immersive experience and so we we've found that you know screening a, a five six seven minute ten minute clip people are sort of so focused on the technical side of it which they should be because obviously you know 48 frames they're, they're going to have an interest that um, the, co the content of the reel tends to be forgotten somewhat. So I just wanted to, um, I, for Comic-Con I wanted to make it all about the content and not the, the technical side of it. Were you surprised at the reaction in Las Vegas of, of what you showed? Do you think that, that the technology eclip eclipsed the story in some way? Uh, well certainly the, the stories that came out of um, CinemaCon was all about the, the 48 frames. It wasn't anything about the, <laughs> the right. footage that people <laughs> saw. Which, you know, when you're a filmmaker that's not necessarily what, what you want to happen. I mean, I, I've got absolute belief and in, in faith in 48 frames, but I think it's, a, it's and, and it, you know, it's an important topic. I mean, it's something that could have ramifications for, for the entire in industry if, if, the, if, you know, higher frame rates are going to become um, more of a normal thing. The, you know, The Hobbit really is the test of that, right. and so I think it's important that that, that that you know it's given its fair judgment, which is really sitting down in December in a, in a nice cinema, not in a convention hall, um, watching a full narrative feature film, and and that's the way to actually judge it, not not in the context of uh, Hall H. Do you think 24 frames per second is a little bit like the fork is always on the left hand side of the plate? That it's a convention that's been adapted, that uh, that's been adopted, and that people are just used to doing it that way. And is it something that is a vestige of an era that's long since forgotten? In other words, is it something that people have accepted as the norm when they need not see it that way? Yeah, <laughs> it is. I mean, you know, the the the, the reality is that um, 24 frames a second is has has got artifacts. You know, it, it has strobing, it has a kind of a flicker that's really, that you, you know, if you pay attention to it, you obviously can notice it, although, you know, the majority of people now, you know, we, we've been to the movies and it's what, what we accept. But I think when you see 48 frames and you see the realism and you see the kind of the, um, the smoothness of the motion and the lack of motion blur, it's not what you associate with going and seeing a film. I mean, it's not. So it's different. Um, but at the same time, it, you know, the overall experience is fantastic, especially in 3D. You don't get any eye strain. It's, it's incredibly com comfortable. Um, and, you know, as a filmmaker, I've always tried to, to make movies that pull the audience out of their seats and immerse them into the, into the film. I mean, I, you know, I want audiences to be transported into the, in, into the movie. And so for me, um, a high frame rate is fantastic because it really makes you feel, feel like you're actually there. But yeah, I, you know, the, 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 big, the big question really that I, I think is that um, as an industry where we have dwindling audiences, especially younger people who, who don't, you know, I mean, when I was young, I, I, I would go to the movies every Friday night. Like, I wouldn't know what I was going to go see right. <laughs> until a day or two before, but it, it was just like what you It was you a did. habit, right? It was a habit, and, and, and that doesn't exist anymore. So you've got to actually provide a reason for people to go to younger people to see films now. And, and, and I think if we, if all this technology is advancing at such a rapid pace, you've got you know, cameras that can shoot incredibly high, high definition, the equivalent of, of what you know, 65 mil was back mm -hmm. in the film days. 
Um, you've got the potential of high frame rate, you've got amazing immersive sound that's being developed now, um, enormous screens, whether it's IMAX or just regular screens that are getting bigger and bigger. And so you've got to, you know, as, as an industry, we surely have to keep using the, technolo the technology that's available to us to, uh, to try to get people to come back to the movies rather than just say, you know what, we peaked in 1930, so let's not change anything. <laughs> I don't think that's a particularly good way of, uh, of uh, looking at it. You know. That's the macro of it all. And the micro, in terms of like how you actually shot this film, composing shots, I don't know if you storyboard, but mm. do you actually compose and shoot the movie differently given the saturation, given the quality, given the, no. the definition that you're going to get? No, 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 no. I mean, it, it is, you know, it's... To me, looking at, at uh, 48 frames a second, plus you know the fact we're shooting on these red epic cameras, which are shooting essentially at, at 4K uh, resolution, it, it's not really a, a great deal different than shooting on the odd on the old Todd AO system uh, or um, you know 65 mil. I mean, it's it's just a, a way of making your pictures look sharper, cleaner, more real. And does it create more rendering time in terms of the visual yeah. effects? Yeah. I mean, yeah. is it like it everything doubles, in visual effects? It, it, it doubles, doubles the rendering time. And then if you're shooting in 3D, it doubles it again. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I remember this from Lord of the Rings movies that you yeah. posted each movie in sequence because the tools that you would have X years later, you did not have in the first film. And I wonder, even with two films, is that the case that you will post one, I mean, obviously you have deadlines, but yeah. are there tools uh, advancing so rapidly that you may have something for the second film that you don't have at your disposal right now, or do you think that those tools no. are pretty much stable? I mean, we're kind of working on, on, on the movies concurrently, really. I mean, the, 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 you know, we've handed over quite a few visual effects shots from the second film already. Um, so no, I, I, I mean, the, the, th the, the biggest impact that happens is um, computers get cheaper and they get faster, so, you know, that's... Um, the, the, the actual, the, the, the technical quality of what we're doing is pretty much, I think it'll be, you know, we're, we're at a place now where, you know, it, it, everything that was impossible to do 10 years ago, you can do now. CGI water was always difficult, CGI mm -hmm. flames was difficult. It's sort of like, the, you're really at a point where anything you can imagine, you can put on film now. Um, and when you go back... And pixels, and I still say put on film. It's, right, it's, 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 pixels. It's gonna be, a, gonna... it's gonna be a habit. <laughs> when you go back, if you were to go back and look at even uh, the last Lord of the Rings movie, yeah. would you be able, as a filmmaker, to watch that and enjoy it, or do you kind of grimace as to what you were what you were able to do then in terms of visual effects? And we have a kind of an apples to apples comparison now with Golem, in that you could look at what you're able to do yeah. in those films and what you're yeah. able to do now. And how will audiences, if you were to put them side by side, what would yeah. audiences notice? And as a filmmaker, what do you notice about what you're able to do now that you weren't able to do several years past? Well, Gollum, um, Gollum certainly benefits from a much more intricate m muscle system uh, because obviously with a CGI character, you're, you're really doing, you're building a, a character in much the same way as a, as a real creature is built. You build the bones, the skeletons, the muscles, you put layers of fat on, you put a skin on, which has to have a translucency depending on what the character is. And, um, and Gollum is a much more sophisticated um, performer now than he was ten, 10 years ago. So in other words, he, he's sort of, he, can, he, can, um, he can express himself with his face. His face has much more intricate you know, muscle system than he did before. I mean, he, he's, we, we, we've deliberately made him look the same because mm -hmm. we, you know, I, I really wanted The Hobbit to, to have a, um, very much a consistency with the first um, three movies. But uh, it's, he's... Yeah, I mean, the, I think the things that I would notice, the, looking back at Lord of the Rings, and I, and I haven't <laughs> looked back at Lord of the Rings, but the things I would notice are probably more the compositing and, and the, um, the, the, the blue screen work, and that's the sort of stuff that's really improved in leaps and bounds over the last 10 years. Just in terms of the plates, in terms of the, the plates entire and frame? The, and the, the, the edges and the lighting and, right. and, 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 and composing different elements together, plus the, um, the fact that, I'll tell you the one thing that, that, that you... We're using a lot more now than we never did in Lord of the Rings are uh, digital doubles where you want to do big stunts or big action sequences. Um, you, you don't rely so much on stuntmen anymore. I mean, we, we certainly do for fight scenes, right. but if you want people leaping off a bridge or, or something's collapsing and they're running underneath, you know, instead of having to stage a major practical effect, the digital doubles are so realistic now that you can literally have, um, you know, these avatars representing your main cast and they look completely real. And how does the camera track them? I mean, is it is it a is it a, 
are you actually programming the camera move to follow that double? Well, uh, well, often like? often the digital doubles are used in completely CG shots. You know, right, completely one hundred percent CG shots. Um, but we've also got uh, we've also got some scenes that we've shot on location where we've got guys sliding down banks and running running um, um, away from some wags and things where we where we're using digital doubles. It's it's you know, and 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 we do it by um, you know we build it again. We build the the character. We scan the actor. Mm -hmm. We um, scan them with their makeup off and then their makeup on with their costume off, costume on and we literally build up the layers and, and, and it's got to the point now where you can have a photo of the actor and a photo of the digital actor side by side and you literally can't oh. tell, tell which is which. And what does that allow you to do as a filmmaker? I mean obviously you're not putting your actors in jeopardy but as a storyteller are, are you able to do things? It's just freedom, yeah, okay. it's, it's just freedom. It, it, it's you know the, the uh, when I was younger making movies you know your imagination would obviously go crazy and you'd imagine all sorts of crazy, crazy you know stunts and visual effects ideas and then there was always that moment where you had to sit down and say okay well that would be cool now how are we actually going to do it and you'd storyboard it and you'd break it down and this would be a practical effect and then you'd have a dummy for this one and you'd have a puppet for that and you'd figure out the ways to do it but now you, you really anything you can imagine you can put on film which is you know it's a pretty incredible advance and it's probably taken about 20 years for that to happen. I can hear the uh, the representatives of the Actors Guild saying <laughs> the leap from digital double to digital lead is not that profound. Do you think there's a, is this more cause for concern for actors or do you think it's just a tool that allows an actor to do more within a given role? Uh, it, it's a tool. I mean, uh, you know, to be honest, if it impacts any, anybody, it's the stunt performers. They're, they're the ones that you tend to do fewer stunts now. Um, and the actors, what, what we generally do is we have the actors motion capture their digital doubles. So they're still, they end up in a suit and they, they you know, whether they're running or jumping or diving or doing whatever the character on screen ha has to do, we, we, we motion capture them doing that basic performance. So they're still in control of their character. I want to talk a little bit about the about the story. Hobbit as a book is, to my mind, a little bit episodic. Um, there's some unexplained absences from a primary character, <laughs> um, and, it, and it, it is a story that is is kind of uh, almost the the parts are greater than its sum uh, in some ways. And I don't know if yeah, as, well, as a of, a in terms of adapting yeah. it, how you kind of crack that nut because. You know from Lord of the Rings what where this is going to go, but the, if you're, and I suspect you are not totally loyal that you go outside the book itself. Mm. But in terms of the main storytelling obstacles of adapting The Hobbit, what were they, and how did you, uh, in the most part, solve them? Well, we had um, a huge advantage in that we we were able to uh, to use the appendices from Return of the King. Um, the story that I as I understand it is that uh, after after Tolkien first published The Lord of the Rings, he was intending to revise The Hobbit to make that story fit more in the keeping with, with the world. He did a, he did a small revision um, in 1951, but then he was, he was thinking about expanding The Hobbit. Right, for the second edition of The Hobbit, where he made some small made kind some of structural small changes, changes right. in, in, which was published in 1951, just as it, around the time that Lord of the Rings was about to come out. But he, um, more to do with Gollum and the ring and, 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 and setting the ring up in, in, the, um, in the context that he, that he needed it to be set up for um, the, the Lord of the Rings. But he then started to flesh out the Hobbit story and he started to flesh out all those absences that Gandalf has and, and, and work in the backstory and work in um, how Thorin came to, um, to talk to Gandalf in the first place and how Gandalf got involved in the quest. And there's, there's, a, there's a lot of material. Um, and so w what we did is we decided at the very beginning that we would take as much of that material as we, as we needed to and we would expand it. So what you're really getting is the, is the um, oh, just to finish off the other bit is that, I mean, because what I understand Tolkien did then is he never, he, he was intending to, 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 to rewrite The Hobbit with all this stuff in, but he, he never did for whatever reason. And so that is about 125 pages, which, which is almost like a story outline. Of appendices. Yeah, right. it's almost like a story outline of what he intended to, how he intended to right. develop it more into uh, the form of, of, of a novel, but um, never got there. So at some point that was, stuck on the end of Return of the King and has been published for, um, for a while on the back of Return of the King, so as an appendices. So that 125 pages of material proved to be 
a fantastic gold mine for us because we were able to go in there and um, start to expand and flesh it out. So this is definitely not just the Hobbit. This, right. is, this is the Hobbit plus the appendices, which doesn't sound like the most sexy title right. in the world. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we call the first movie The Hobbit, the second one The Appendices. <laughs> yeah. And how do you make a decision about narratively uh, where to split the movies in terms of resolution, in terms of cliffhanger, in terms of, and, and a more fundamental question, how much knowledge does the audience need to bring to either film to have an experience identical or approximate to somebody who is steeped in the whole lore? Uh, well, hopefully very little. I mean, we've tried to we've tried to, to, to write and shoot The Hobbit in a way that obviously you don't have to be a, a, a Tolkien aficionado to enjoy it. And that's, you know, the beauty of that is it is the beginning of the story. So right. we are literally, I mean, we, we've got a better chance of doing that than, than, than we did with... Um, with the ring stories, because we sort of, you know, we are establishing the ring and where it com comes from. We're establishing a, some of the characters like Gandalf and B Bilbo get introduced in the story. So, it, it, that w in that regard, um, the beginning was easier than certainly um, adapting F Fellowship of the Ring. And, uh, you know, the, the 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 challenge, which is going back to your original question, the challenge is putting, you know, character arcs into the story because there isn't really any profound character arcs in, in the novel, um, and nor is there really in the appendices. The appendices has got a lot of action and a lot of, of adventure, but um, so that's something that, that Philippa, Fran and I do as the writers. We, we, we try to, you know, and we revise all the time. We've written the script as we've been shooting it, really. I mean, we'll, we, we've revised it and revised it and revised it, and as the actors are performing, we're working out, we're just sort of, sort of massaging the... Um, their character stories. And so you've got to end the first movie, I'm not going to tell you where it ends because I don't want to spoil the climax of, of, of the film, but you've certainly got to end it with an emotional climax. I mean, and we have had to create that. that that's not, not in the book. Okay. Yeah. To end the first film so that it, it, it even though it's of a piece. Emotional, it? Yeah, even though this, the adventure is continuing, you, right. you, you feel that, 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 that the characters involved have, have gone on a journey and, 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 and have reached a a place where they're different to how they began and, and, and some certain cathartic things happen right. towards the end of the first film. Uh, Tolkien, as a writer, was also somebody who disdained allegory. I mean, mm. in, and I think a lot of people can read into the, his books, his writing, whatever they want to read into, but it yeah. seems as if he really didn't want to say what it represented or what its larger point was. And I right. wonder, as a filmmaker, uh, if you see narrative background that you are, either it's allegorical or it's not, but is that part of the revisions and the adaptation process, that it's not just getting mm. characters for it as opposed to episodes, but is that part of your, your adaptation as well? Do you well think? I, I think I um, share a, uh, the same point of view as Tolkien. <laughs> I don't really like to build meaning. Into, I mean, I, I just like to tell stories. I, I don't set out to, you know, I don't set out to... Um, Try to preach to people and uh, and put hidden meaning into things. I, I just think you know if you can entertain people and give people a good time in the movies, you're doing your job well. And it doesn't have to get any more complicated than that. But you know, I mean, certainly some of the themes that were important to Tolkien, and this is more uh, you know a Lord of the Rings. Um, uh, it was more profound in, in Lord of the Rings with his experiences in the First World War and the loyalty of being with friends and comrades and sacrifice. Um, you know, some of those themes were felt to us like whether he wanted to acknowledge them or not. You know that you could sort of, you know, you, you see somebody's life work it somehow reflects the experiences they've been through, and so we we were aware of it when we were shooting Rings. The Hobbit, the Hobbit doesn't really have anything quite that profound in it, but um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I I I'm try to be in, as um, as Alfred Hitchcock said. Um, some people's films are, are, are slices of life, mine are slices of cake, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. one of my favorite quotes. <laughs> or uh, I think as Samuel Goldblum said, if you want to send a message, use Western Union. Right? <laughs> right, right, right. The, uh, the, obviously, your tool set, visual effects, and we'll talk a little bit about Weta, have, have changed uh, remarkably. As a filmmaker, um, if you were making this movie you know, five or ten years ago, do you think yeah. you would have different instincts as a filmmaker, and have you grown, and how, how would you say you've evolved as a storyteller outside of the technology? Mm, that's an interesting question. I don't know. I, n I never actually think about myself in that, those terms. I never um, analyze myself. I, you know, this movie, I felt a degree of confidence that, that I, I possibly haven't had in the past, in the sense that I, I, um, I felt comfortable in, in a way. Then um, it's 
I, I just guess being as old as I am, I, I kind of, you know, a lot of the problems that we have resolved over the years, not just with the Lord of the Rings films, but with any of the films you make, you know, you're, you're always, every film you make, you, you, you figure out how to do things a little bit better than the one before. Mm -hmm. So the older you get, the more films you make. Um, you know, certainly, that, I mean, Lord of the Rings was, was uh, you know, th there were some huge logistical challenges of setting up a film that large with that many people in New Zealand, mm -hmm. uh, the country that had never, you know, made films of that scale before, getting the sheer infrastructure, logistics, the crew, the people, the, and, and then figuring out how to do it. I mean, that was the time that we really, you know, we, we were working it out. So having had that experience and then on to King Kong as well, this, this time round, you know, we had a really well-oiled machine. And so mm -hmm. I, I guess that's what I'm, I, I'm referring to, really. It felt, it felt like we all knew what we were doing. Um, but the challenge of making a good movie is still there. You, you don't know how to make a good movie right. One, right. one year to the next. You just have to go on your instincts, really. How would you say your, your relationship with and the work of Weta has changed in the intervening years? Because they're doing a lot of work for other filmmakers. Yeah. They're obviously Thank had heavens. some experience with... <laughs> Thank heavens. Yeah. With, uh, I can retire one day and I don't have to keep giving them work. They did a ton, they did a ton of work on Avatar, didn't they? They, they did every, everything. Right. Uh, so I'm wondering, uh, the tea is here. Oh, thank you. So we'll have to probably put it off camera so we don't have continuity problems, right? I, I'm not worried about continuity. Okay. This is, this is the worst tea ever. Me, me, me it's neither. It's the worst tea ever. Me neither. I'm, I never worry. I never worry about continuity. That's great. Great by my, yeah, by my taste. This is all right. It's not too bad. Um, let, me, let me ask the question yes, again. Good. Yeah, where are um, Weta has evolved as a company. I suspect your relationship with Weta has evolved. Um, how has the work that they've done for filmmakers like Jim Cameron affected what they have to offer you? And, and how has your relationship as a kind of a partner in that process changed over the years? Um, well, in a, in, in a, in a way, I, my, I guess my relationship with Weta ha has changed in the sense that I feel, I feel much less of an owner of the company now. And I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm still a co-owner of it, as much more of a client. <laughs> Um, so who do you complain to when things aren't going well? I complain to them. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, it's like I, I do keep a very, I, I'm, I'm very, very careful to keep an arm's length relationship with them because also, you know, the studio is spending their money on the, the visual effects shots and I, I'm sort of, I, I have a, a conflict of interest. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, the only thing that matters to me is the movie and, and the movie comes first. And so, uh, you know, my, I, I don't, I haven't been to a wetter business meeting for possibly you know eight nine years. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't sit around at a table every month going through the books and looking at the finances. I don't get involved in any of that stuff at all. I, I really keep it at arm's length, and so I really just approach wetter like a filmmaker who wants some shots done, and they provide a budget and the studio vets it, and um, and away we go. But to to also to uh, um, answer a bit more of your question, certainly we're on Avatar. Um, we had worked closely with Jim for two or three years and, and, and some of the, the facial system that I was describing that Gollum has now, the much more sophisticated facial animation system, was stuff that was evolved on, on the back of Avatar. Because so, his camera on the face, the way he was yeah, able to create much more performance out of face. And, and, yeah, and the muscles and the way, yeah. that, the way that when you're motion capturing dots on people's faces, what those dots actually mean. I mean, the movement that the actor does is recorded, but then what, how that translates to pushing the... the, the CG muscle around on the face and the skin and the way that the skin slide, slides over, over the, the, the layer of fat and everything, how everything has to move. So there's a, they, they really re, rebuilt an entirely new facial system, what they call a facial system, for, um, for mocap animation, for Avatar. And so, you know, we, we actually use, use it on Tint Tintin as well. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, certainly the advances with Gollum that have happened in the last 10 years, Avatar has been a big part of that. So are there shots that you can do, I mean, I know that probably you've always thought that nothing is impossible, but are there shots that on the spectrum of impossible... I haven't always thought that, okay. <laughs> but I have recently. But on the spectrum of impossible versus yeah. possible, does that line shift every, every time? And are there shots that you contemplate, contemplated and even executed on The Hobbit that you didn't even contemplate on Lord of the Rings because you thought they would be beyond the reach of the technology and your yep. ability to integrate them. I mean, what would be a good example? Uh, well, I mean, a, a, a good example is is the the way in which on when we did Lord of the Rings, we you, we use miniatures, we built miniatures. So so pretty much on you know any time you see a piece of architecture um, or a, a, a sort of a an unreal landscape on Lord of the Rings, whether it's Mount Doom or Minas Tirith or Helm's Deep. 
you're looking at you look you're looking at a miniature, and some some of the miniatures are the size of this room. I mean, they're they're large, um, and the thing with a miniature is that you you you, you have to. You, you've got a, a, a couple of constraints. One is that you physically, you know, you have a very large camera that you have to get close if you want to do a shot where the camera is flying over over the rooftops of Minas Tirith. You know, you literally can get the camera so close to the rooftops, and sometimes you have to use a periscope sort of lens to get them to be able to drift over the top top, top of the roofs. But if I wanted to fly down between the roofs and go down to the street, I couldn't because you physically, with the miniature, you couldn't fit the bulk of the camera into that space. Um, and and so the you know the miniatures had to be planned in advance. They had they they were a little limited to what you could do. You do the, you design the most interesting shots you could, and then then the miniatures had to be shot. And that was a very long, laborious, painstaking process. So, you know, one shot might take a week of, mm -hmm. sh of um, shooting. I think our miniature unit on Lord of the Rings shot for about eight hundred days mm. of, of continuous shooting over literally over probably about a four year period. Um, so now on the Hobbit, we have no miniatures at all. It's all CG. It's all CG. So if you want to build a, 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 a city, you build it in the computer. Now, what I can do then is that if I, if I want to fly over the rooftops, I can do that. But now I can go down between the roofs. I can fly through the window of somebody's house. Mm -hmm. I could fly through their keyhole if I wanted to. <laughs> you know, you, you actually, you're, you're, you're completely unconstrained. And, and so um, there, there's like two, two layers of creativity I'm, I'm finding. Is one is that I, I, you know, plan the shots I shoot on set, I, I shoot the actors and you know whatever it is that we're filming as part of the live action shoot. And then as we're in post-production, or I mean I've only just finished shooting, but even in the last year while we've been shooting I've been, I've been you know, cutting the, the films together. So it, there's, a, there's another layer of creativity which is I, I get a chance outside of the stress of being on set and the deadlines and the, the pressure of having to shoot something, you, you get the chance to sit back and you think, you know what? That shot that I was thinking about, we could actually do it much, much better. So let's, and, and, and I haven't got to worry that that miniature's already been shot mm -hmm. and it took a week to shoot. I don't have to be concerned about that. I can just say to, to the weather guys, you know, that, um, that shot that we talked about, let's just do it a little, a little differently. Let's change the lens. Let's, mm -hmm. you know, fly lower. Let's do faster. Let's spin the camera around at the end. I, I, can, keep, I can keep being creative right until the very last minute. Whereas with, with, with miniatures, you had to, you know, several months, because once you shot the miniature, you then had to put the people into it and the skies right. and, the, and, the, and, and the characters. So you, you had a lot more work to do. So I, I can keep um, developing these ideas all the way through post-production instead of having to have them locked off in advance, which but is kind of fun. It's, it's, it, it creates a very, um, a, a, a sense of freedom during post-production. There's, a, there's a, uh, a filmmaking divide about like what the camera can and cannot do. Jim Cameron believes that just because a camera can fly through a keyhole, it yes. shouldn't, whereas no. Robert Zemeckis will fly it through a keyhole. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious if you, have a, uh, if you have a belief of what the camera can and cannot I, I do. do. I do tend to, I do tend to, um, to take the, uh, the approach that you've got, to, you've got to make people believe that, that, that what they're looking at is really happening. And so I, I, I wouldn't want to distract people by doing some crazy camera thing that was, that was impossible. I mean, we do things all the time, like we actually build in bumps and shakes in the camera. So because you know the, the the thing with a, a digital camera and a digital camera move is that it's obviously can it's, it starts out being perfect right and so you're always working it back to um, you know we have shots of um, CG characters who are gall galloping along on the backs of these wags which are like giant wolves and and so you know you want to do a do a, a tracking shot you could do a perfect tracking right. shot but then you want to make it seem like you're filming it off a vehicle and the vehicle's hitting hitting bumps and, and right. uh, potholes, and so the thing's just right. bouncing up and down, and the operator's trying to stay on right. on, on target. So Loses you, the frame for you're, 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 a second, you're and then catches all, You build all those all those things because the so. audience subconsciously will read it that yeah. way. Yeah. The uh, I would imagine as a as a storyteller, one of the great things about the Hobbit are the incredible creatures. Um, that I mean, at every chapter, you have the introduction yeah. of. <laughs> You know, one, you know, they're trolls, they're eagles, they're yeah. elves, goblins, wolves. And in terms of creature design, did this present more opportunities than Lord of the Rings in terms of, of your imagination and your, I don't know who was doing your lead creature design or character design? It, it's uh, Weta, Weta Workshop, right. Richard, Richard Taylor and team at Weta Workshop. Yeah. Right. So yeah. what was that process like? Because it's, I mean, you have, I would think, almost unlimited ability to conjure up these creatures because you can get them to perform in ways that you can get them to perform. What was that creative process like in terms of design, in terms of 
the looks and style that you it's, wanted to get. It, it's it's interesting. It's I mean, one of the things that I found with the, the Hobbit is um, with the orcs and goblins, who it, traditionally in the past we have used you know guys in suits um, in prosthetic makeup. I mean, all every single orc I think on on rings was an actor in prosthetics. What we've what we've tended to do in the Hobbit is to do a couple of different things because 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 prosthetic makeup is always frustrating because at the end of the day. If you want the character to talk, which a lot of the orcs and goblins do, you 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 can design the most incredible prosthetics, but you've still got eyes where eyes have to be and the mouth where a mouth has to be. So that human triangle of two eyes and a mouth is is very difficult to disguise. And no matter what you do with ears and heads and chins and noses, it, it's kind of so. One of the things that we're doing on um, on on the Hobbit, which is definitely. Uh, um, you know, technology we have available now that we didn't have 10 years ago is that we, we often shoot the orcs as people in suits, but they, they just have a, um, they just have like a leotard on their head with motion capture dots mm -hmm. on it. So a lot of the orcs, even though they're played by performers, the makeup is going to be CG makeup which allows me to put the eyes further apart, it allows me to, they can open their mouths and scream in a much more dynamic way than what they ever could. So I'm finding less use for prosthetics and more use for digital faces. And in some cases with goblins, we, we've shot um, guys in suits and we're also adding a lot of CG goblins to the same shots. Who can, they, so in some shots you've got, you've got CG guys, uh, you, you've got the suited guys pushing our dwarves around, but then you've got other goblins scurrying down uh, walk, walkways and gantries and bridges in ways that would be very hard for any performer to do. So you're sort of blending these different techniques together. There are not a lot of uh, piece of literature that use goblins and elves, but there are a lot that use dragons. And I'm curious, yeah. when you're designing a dragon, are you yes. conscious of how dragons, yes. you know, the, the... I'm very conscious of it. <laughs> so what do you do? How do you, do you work away from something that the audience is used to? Do you try to yeah. meet them halfway? What is the thought process like in d designing a, a, a creature who is so well known in the popular well, that culture? that dragon is still in, in, in the process of being designed. He's not actually designed, and he does, um, he does have a little cameo in the first movie, so um, he is some, something that we're working on, but fortunately only in, a, only in a couple of very fleeting shots. So the bigger problem with him will be for next year. But um, no, we, we've gone through a, a lot of design ideas for Schmaug, and um, yeah, I, I, I'm not I'm not wanting to be too radical. The trouble with the trouble with um, redesigning dragons I've found is that if you really get fruity with it, it, it suddenly starts to look like a, 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 some sort of monster monster from another planet. Right. You know, you, you very quickly can go into science fiction territory, and, and I don't want to do that, and nor do I want to do something that is going to be... I, I mean, people expect a dragon. I mean, Schmaug is one of, you know, the Hobbit's one of the most famous dragon stories in the world, really. So I, I, I'm not trying to... Um, I'm not trying to, to step away from the dragon. I just want to present the most venal, scary, decrepit... Um, nasty dragon that I possibly can. I mean, it's as much about the character and the personality of, of, of um, Schmaug. I mean, he is incredibly cunning and, and he's very old. And he is, uh, he, he's, you know, he, he's intelligent and, and sly. So there's a lot of reptilian um, kind of cunning with that character. So, I mean, I, that's, where, that's where you sort of start in designing. You, 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 what, does he have to, what does he have to do in the story and how does he have to appear? And then you work your way back into what he actually looks, looks like. But, um, yeah, I'm, you know, he, he's coming along. You want your yeah, dragon to be real, in other words. Yeah, as real as possible, <laughs> right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, you, too you don't, you, not too fanciful and not too much of a distraction to the audience. He's got to feel right. I mean, it's, it is one of those, he's just got, has to right. feel perfect. Gollum in the book, I think, has one scene, right? One yeah. chapter. Yeah. Uh, I suspect you have found a different or more opportunities for him to appear, or is he um, basically one and done? He's, well, it's certainly uh, um, in terms of the first movie, it's, it's one. And my lips are sealed beyond that. Well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> uh, you, 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 said, uh, you said earlier about visual effects, I think. It's a long, laborious process. Or maybe you were talking about uh, miniature design. Yeah. This movie itself had its long, laborious process. There was years of gestation where Guillermo was involved. Yeah. I, I don't know if you ever would you know, say those were two years of, of treading water that were well spent. But was there an upside, and it's probably more than two years, was, were those delays in any way beneficial to the process? Or do you regret that Guillermo wasn't able to stick around? What, what's your takeaway from 
those delays and how they affected the resulting films? Uh, well, it's an, it's an interesting question. Um, I don't think they were in any way beneficial. I mean, there, there, there were two different movies, really. That was, just, I mean, where, when, when Guillermo was working on it, uh, which I think he was working on it for, for about 18, 18 months. I mean, he was designing his his film, and um, and I, I never looked at the designs and, and, unless he had stuff to show me. And um, and you know he was he he had his head into the film that he was making. And, and, and yet the the thing that was most frustrating during that period was the fact that there was never a green light. I mean, we we were working for eighteen months, and it was during a, the, that whole you know MGM. Um, stuff with the politics and and there was a lot of people working very hard to try to get the film off the ground I mean I know that Warner Brothers went through all sorts of discussions with MGM about buying them out of the Hobbit I mean you know as you can imagine I mean every every possible conversation occurred and at the same time MGM were you know every every morning we'd, we'd look in the in the trades and there'd been some story about slipping into bankruptcy and and you know no bond movie was being made at that time and and, and it was so it was it was frustrating in in that in that regard is that, is that you know it's one thing to be it's one thing to develop a script for for three or four months you know and, and then to try to put a budget together and get it green lit it's one it's, it's another thing to be working for 18 months and putting your heart and passion as GDT did into a project mm -hmm. Where you you've, you've at no point in that project did somebody say you know what you've got a green light your budget's approved we're making the film, at no point so so it, that was frustrating and um, and then when he left, it, it from memory it took another three or four months before before there was a green light I mean it didn't it and I um, I stepped in because it just didn't seem right to bring another director in uh, when a lot of money had been spent and, and, and I just felt responsible for now having to kind of get this film on the road as, as um, smoothly as we could. And, uh, and, then I, and so I, I essentially found myself short of time. I, I mean, what the end result was, I think by the time we had a green light, which was something like um, um, August or September, we, we were having to shoot in fe February. And, this would have and, been August, September, twenty ten, uh, yeah, right? And yeah. start shooting in early twenty eleven. Yeah, right? and 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 I I found myself because I hadn't prepped the film like GDT had. I right. I'd been, I you know it was uh, and so I started looking at the, the designs and then I found that I can't I couldn't shoot GDT's film. I mean he's an incredible visionary guy and all his designs were were, were GDT ish designs and I thought no I. If I'm going to do it, I need to actually be comfortable. I, 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 need, I need to do the thing that I want to do in my head. So I, I suddenly found myself scrambling. I mean, I was literally scrambling to get uh, designs ready on time for, what, for the, the, the film that I wanted to make. And uh, we were revising the script furiously. And uh, so, no, the delay didn't help anybody. It didn't help him, didn't help us, it didn't help the film. And does any of that, of, of any of his ideas survive, or are they mostly... Well, his DNA's in there. I mean, the way that, you know, the way that I, I, I went about the design is I'd look at the stuff that, you know, I said, show me the stuff that he's approved. And then I'd look at it, and, and, and certainly elements of it I liked, other elements... I just didn't feel comfortable with because they're much more what 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 he was doing. I, I just didn't want to be making a GDT movie, which would have not served the project well at all. I mean, you know, I've never directed somebody else's script. I've, I've never in my right. life picked up someone's screenplay and shot it. I, I can't do that. I, I kind of have to originate stuff. So, to, to in order for me to absorb myself in it, so I so I looked at designs and some bits and pieces. Um, you know, if there were things I liked, I probably kept some elements and got the guys to design around them and design other things. So the whole thing became very very much a, 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 an amalgam, mm -hmm. really. Um, but a, a, a lot of it was, um, and a lot of it I kind of, I, I just designed as we were shooting too. I mean, the, the beauty with having an 18 month shoot is that I, I, you know, initially in that first, in that, in that <laughs> crazy sort of four or five months of prep, which is really all that I ended up with, you know, I, I looked at the first few months of shooting and, and focused on that. And so all the way through the shoot, I've been having to look at designs and set designs for what's coming up in the next two, two or three months. So it's been actually, I, I sort of ended up doing pre-production and production at the same time. Wow. And how is Tintin fitting into all of that? Well, that Tin, Tintin is what I was, uh, I, I spent most of my time on Tintin while GDT was on The Hobbit. So while uh, it was in production, uh, you... Yeah, I mean, I right. was working with Stephen and, right. and, 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 you know, working on the script of that a little bit and, um, you know, working with him on the motion capture side of things and stuff while, um, during that period. But once, once I got involved in The Hobbit, that was, a, that was T Tintin was largely done at that point and Stephen, Stephen was cut, cutting it together, so it was a good time for me to be able to step So how does the second Tintin film overlap with the second Hobbit film? 
Well, the, the second Tintin film is being written at the moment. We haven't got a script yet, so we haven't right. got, a, got, a, got, a, got a budget, um, and we haven't got a green, a green light, light yet. So, um, you know, so the date, what, 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 I have, um, what I have got is at some stage next year, which is why I've been cutting a lot of The Hobbit to get myself a, ahead a little bit and, and, you know, going into the second film a lot. Um, some, some stage next year I'll do six weeks of motion capture for Tintin. Tint, tint. But, but Sometime dates, between now and the end of the year, you'll do. Two two thousand and thirteen. Okay, but I'm sorry. Yeah, before the yeah. second film. Is, yeah, is yeah, finished. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I mean, at the moment, Tintin's being written, and then I'm concentrating on getting the first Hobbit film out the door. So ne next next year, when we don't have to do quite so much shooting, right. and we're just in post production on, on the Hobbit, I, I will. Um, but but uh, those dates are up in the air. Depends on the on the budget and the studio. So. When you're able to show the completed uh, first film of Hobbit. Yeah. What do you hope if you were eavesdropping in conversations in the in the theater lobby as people are walking out of the movie? What do you hope they're saying? If you have succeeded in in your ambitions for the film, what are they talking about as they're leaving the movie? Nah, uh, just that they've enjoyed it. <laughs> it's all that I, I ever want any, anyone to do. You know, you want people to feel like it was worth their effort to go, go to the cinema and to pay their money and to have a great, good good night. I mean, that's all I ever do when when I go go see a film. I don't. Uh, you know, I, I just want to be enter entertained, and I want to be reminded of why it's cool to go to the movies. Mm -hmm. And what do you think will have to happen to get people to start talking about the movie again and not 48 frames per second? Well, I, I hope they talk about 48 frames a second in December when the film's actually there to be seen. I, and I hope a lot of people see it at 48 frames. I mean, you know, at, at, at this stage, we're, um, we're certainly, you know, there'll be a lot of cinemas that will be playing both. I mean, the, the, the theaters, that will, there'll, there'll be a choice. So, so. I, you know, I, I just think it's um, I just think it's something that we shouldn't ram down people's throats. I, um, it's something that they shouldn't have to pay a premium for. It should be the same price. It's just, uh, it's just a. Have you talked to the theater owners about this? Yeah, who yeah, haven't? Yeah. Uh, they won't, you know, put in a new popcorn fryer until somebody else pays for it. No, Are you confident not, that they'll make those? There's upgrades? certainly no. There's certainly no discussion about putting any upcharge on for 40, forty-eight frames. Okay. And 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 there shouldn't be. There shouldn't right. be because, um, you know, I, I just think you can't keep charging people more money every time a piece of technology comes Right. Out. My question is, do you think the yeah. theater owners are willing to do that? Because they're going to have to do some upgrades to their software. Are they going to be willing to do what's necessary to show okay. this movie Apparently, and not yeah. pass it along? Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So that's what we've been, that's what we've been all talk talking about. That's and right. I'm sure you've been everybody, talking about everybody it. Everybody seems to be on board. No, 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 they do. Good. They do. I've not heard a single, a single mention. The studio are, are very, very adamant that it should be the same, same price. Good. I hope they succeed in that conversation. Yeah.